Bewegung heute Siegen durch Deutschland parieren, dann weiß ich, ihr schließt euch den Kolonnen an. Und wir wissen, an uns liegt Deutschland, in uns marschiert Deutschland und hinter uns kommt Deutschland. Separate the officers for interrogation! I'll be damned. General Spatz, we meet at last. Reich Marshal Goering. My wife, my daughter. Your eighth Air Force has destroyed my beautiful Luftwaffe and leveled our beautiful cities. Even so, I prefer to surrender to a fellow airman. Gentlemen, uh, may I? Unbelievable. Those pictures were on every wire service. 
American officers throwing a party for Hitler's number two man. What was the commander thinking? I'm told it's a code of honor among airmen that transcends politics. And brains, apparently. The commander was reprimanded. And Ike has ordered that Goering be treated no differently than any other prisoner of war. Excuse me. I've finagled some real coffee from the Chief Justice's office. Elsie's the best scavenger in the entire building. <laughs> you shouldn't have gone to so much trouble. Oh, coffee's no trouble. Now a set of tires, that's another story. <laughs> I still can't believe he's gone. For me, it was like losing a father. Truly. Whatever I have, whatever I am, it's because of Roosevelt. I was in London seeing Churchill when the news came. With the end of the war in sight, the president had sent me as his confidant to discuss a rather tricky subject. What to do with captured Nazi leaders? What was Churchill's opinion? <laughs> he said they should be summarily shot for crimes against humanity. What's your opinion? Well, I think if it's a crime for the Nazis to shoot people without a trial, how could it be less so for us to do the same thing? That's Truman's feeling, exactly. And Churchill now shares that view. Surprisingly enough, so does Stalin. You're talking about a war crimes trial, which they attempted after the last war, and it completely unraveled. Because it had no weight. But this will be an international tribunal comprised of the four powers, America, England, France, and Russia. President Truman wants the best prosecutor in the country, one with a reputation for being tough, but impartial. He wants you, Bob. I haven't prosecuted a case in years. President Roosevelt chose you for the Supreme Court because of your integrity as a prosecutor. That's why Truman has picked you for this, because he wants a fair trial, not a legal lynching. I like it right here, Sam. I mean, this would mean I would have to step down. Temporary leave of absence. You'll be back in six months, maybe seven. Is the president aware of the fact that I'm completely opposed to the death penalty? Yes. He's not concerned because he knows you, you'll do whatever is right. As you know, a fair trial means an uncertain outcome. If we don't prove the defendant's guilt, we'd have to let them walk, even if we could smell the blood on their hands. Do the Allied powers understand that? Well, Truman does. You'll have a chance to make it clear to them. The trial is yours to create, Bob. You get to set the rules. Hire the staff, find the setting. You even get to pick the defendants. This trial could unravel, too. Like the last attempt, if it is poorly planned, if it is unsound legally or morally. Or it could establish a basis for conduct among nations that would alter history for generations to come. The trial will be held in Germany. That's what the defendants are, the evidence, witnesses. Are there any decent hotels still standing? I don't relish the idea of spending months on some dreary army base. We won't have to worry about that. Uh, no wives allowed at Army's request. Bad for morale. You know, all those men over there for years without their... If you don't want me there, fine. I'll be downstairs whenever you're ready. I'm afraid I have to ask you to get dressed and pack for travel. Where are you moving us? Only the Reich Marshal. You're being transferred to Bad Mondorf. Well, you know, it's a very pleasant spa, but why must I go alone? Because that's where they're rounding up German war criminals. No! No, no, no. 
no, no, no. I'm sorry about that. Get dressed, please. You must be brave. <laughs> very, very brave. Heather, you hear? <laughs> June Butcher of Krakow, and we've seen the camps too. That cheap bastard! <laughs> I must say, I was lucky when the arms ministry was destroyed in an air raid in 1943. It rid me of useless paperworks and pencil pushers. <laughs> Sir, what do you think was the single most effective thing you did during the war? When Hitler appointed me his minister of armaments, I threw out the military chiefs and turned to the professionals. Industrialists and engineers. Then I borrowed the ideas of Walter Rathenau, the great Jewish chief of the German economy during the last war. Sanitization of parts, the division of labor, and the maximum use of the assembly line. Thank you, Dr. Speer. Gentlemen, we'll now break for lunch. Dr. Albert Speer. Obviously, you are under arrest for Major Walker. Pay attention, orders are in. Now listen up. You'll all be taken to different places of detention. The following prisoners will go to Bad Mondorf as defendants in future war crimes trials. Step forward. Field Marshal William Keitel. Grand Admiral Carl Dunitz. Colonel General Alfred Yodel. Follow me. I haven't left Washington since before the war. I couldn't even remember how to pack. I was so worried about bringing half the things that we need for the office, I completely forgot half the things that I need. I have one set of nylons for the entire time, and they already have a run. I mean, I even traded ration coupons with my friend Lowen so I could buy nylons. <laughs> you are as jittery as a hen. What is the matter with you? I've never been up in an airplane before. Morning, Robert. Morning, John. Bob. Tom. Huh? Robert. Good morning. Gentlemen, this is my chief secretary, Elsie Douglas. Elsie, this is Tom Dodd, who'll be deputy prosecutor. Well, it's nice to finally meet you, Miss Douglas. <laughs> Pleasure. Colonel John Harlan Amon, who'll be head of interrogations. Miss Douglas. Colonel Telford Taylor, who'll be the liaison with the other prosecuting teams. Pleasure. All mine. And Colonel Robert Story, who'll be the head of our documents division. Pleased to meet you, ma'am. Colonel. Now that we're all here, let's go. Military leaders? Political leaders? Well, what about the bankers and the industrialists who funded the Nazis? What about the soldiers and civilians who actually carried out the atrocities? Can't put the whole damn country on trial. But we do need to suggest the scope of the crimes. I want this trial to be the first of many. Well, then how about choosing a symbolic figurehead from each category? We cover the whole spectrum. And that way, no one group gets off scot-free. Makes sense. Yeah, if we win convictions, we can just keep right on prosecuting Nazis till the cows come home. But remember, we may also fail to win convictions, in which case some or all of the defendants could go free. I'm still wrestling with the validity of this trial. Crimes committed during war have never been called crimes. Let's focus on existing law. What existing laws did the Nazis break? Well, they broke peace treaties, border treaties, certainly Geneva Convention and Hague Convention. Right. Every time they invaded a country, they broke the law. My fear is that at the end of the day, when all is said and done, this trial will be perceived as nothing more than triumph of superior might. The winner is exacting punishment on the losers. Our task is to make sure that this is not the triumph of superior might, but the triumph of superior morality. We're in a very interesting position here. We're in a position to fashion a future in which aggressive war will be dealt with as a crime. Here, here.
Identify yourself. Fritz Sauchel, sir. Head of labor conscription. Former head. Julius Streicher. Publisher of... Sir, I can't pronounce it. Der Sturm. It's fifth. You bankers are Jews. You think I don't know that? Shut up. Hjalmar Horace Grilly Schacht, formerly president of the Reichsbank and minister of the economy. I do not understand why I have been accused here. I'm your jailer, not your lawyer. You'll get your day in court. Hans Fritsche. Chief of Radio Operation in the Nazi Propaganda Ministry. Rudolf Hess, former Deputy Fuhrer. Hess. You. Joachim von Ribbentrop. Nazi Foreign Minister. You. Colonel, this is Dr. Robert Lai, head of the German Labor Front. You're Albert Speer? Yes, sir. What's wrong with this man? <laughs> His mind is not what it used to He's be. He's an old drunk. It finally caught up with him. I said, shut up! Corner. This man, Stryker, is a disgusting person. A pornographer and a Jew baiter. I do not wish to be housed with him. We make no distinction. Colonel, we respectfully protest our arrest. We are only following orders, nothing more. As a fellow soldier, surely you must understand. Now you're no longer a soldier. You are all war criminals. All of you. Lock them up. These Nazi bastards. Where's Gord? Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring at your service, sir. You are in the United States Army stockade at Bad Mondorf. Did they tell you why you were here? Because we lost the war, and I assumed to be shot or hanged. That's up to the court. I've heard of this court. Its opinion does not concern me. The opinion of the German people, that is what really matters. Is that so? It is so. History will show that everything I did was for the greater German Reich. There will be statues of Hermann going all over Germany in 50 years. Little statues, perhaps, but one in every home. You're as fat as a house. Starting right now, I'm putting you on a diet. You will be mentally and physically fit to stand trial. Who is it? Hans Frank, sir. Try to cut his wrist and throat. These soldiers stopped him before he could do any real damage. The Jew butcher of Krakow. Corporal, take him to the infirmary. Have him checked out. I want a four-man watch on him around the clock. On the double. Yes, sir. Good work, Captain. What's your name? Gilbert, sir. You and your men want to chow with us? Thank you, sir. You a surgeon? Psychologist. faced with, or so it appears, is the secular equivalent of drafting the Ten Commandments. Now, each nation has its own criminal statutes, but for the world at large, none exist. None are necessary. We are trying war criminals whose guilt is unquestioned by the governments we represent. But General, if we're going to have a trial, it must be based on law. It must be a fair It trial. must only determine degree of guilt and appropriate punishment. A completely fair trial with opposing counsel, direct examination, and cross-examination. Precisely. Before judges that act as referees. As in a sporting match? I know, but what the That is not the way it is done in my country. No, in France, lawyers merely help the accused prepare a defense. They have little role in the court itself. In the United States, a defendant is entitled to his lawyer's most aggressive representation. Yes, as in Britain. You would allow a man such as Ernst Kaltenbrunner, responsible for the Gestapo, concentration camps, for killing millions of innocent people to stand before a court of law and declare himself not guilty. That is precisely what we would allow. 
20 million of my people were killed by these fascist criminals. Half of them civilians, killed without mercy. How many died in Washington this way, Mr. Justice Jackson? General, it occurs to me that perhaps separate trials might be the most satisfactory way to reconcile our differences. The United States and the British, along with the French if they choose, will conduct a trial with the Nazis that we currently have in captivity. Kaltenbrunner, Frank, Speer, Gehring. And the Russians, of course, would be free to hold their own trial with the ones that uh, you have on hand. <laughs> there is no need to be so impulsive. We are, after all, allies. We must try to bridge our differences. Well, at least the prosecution's a unified group now, even if we did have to compromise with the French and let the judges be the jury. I must say, your neat little trump card turned Comrade General into a pussycat. Well, I didn't enjoy playing it. I didn't want to sandbag the poor guy. I would have preferred to convince him. Oh, the old boy was quite convinced by your subtle reminder that we've got most of the big Nazi fish while they only have a couple of minnows. <laughs> Nonetheless, I couldn't argue his point. My country was spared the worst of it. No bombed out cities, no slaughtered children. I couldn't begin to know. How is it you can look out on all this and still want to guarantee these men a vigorous defense? I want to put National Socialism on trial so they'll incriminate themselves. Besides, I don't ever want this to happen again. Well. <clears throat> There's no question you're the undisputed leader in all this. Today, prove that. So when we finish our work here, you better go to Germany, find a place for the trial. If anything still exists, that is. brother came here as a college student. I still have the picture book he brought me. It was nothing like this. This isn't even the same city. There were medieval bridges and gingerbread houses. This was also the site of some of Hitler's biggest rallies. Nuremberg was the spiritual center of the Third Reich. General Clay, what are the odds, really, of finding the housing we'll need for the thousands of people that will be attending this trial? Army guarantees it. Parts of the city were untouched by the bombings. There's hundreds of fine houses, some vacant, others whose owners are desperate for money. What's that smell? There's still around 30,000 bodies trapped under the rubble. Ready? Yeah, follow me. Grand old palace of justice. A landmark in more ways than one. It took five bomb hits, but just shrugged them off. Courtrooms upstairs, offices, that whole wing there, and behind that wall, all the jail cells you'll need. Okay, just right this way. Justice Jackson, the courtroom. This is a mess. It'll take a lot of work. A lot of work. But it's doable. Bob? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments in the same building where the Nuremberg laws were decreed that deprived old German Jews of their rights. This is it. 
This is the place to hold the trial. Give me the word, and I'll have General Patton move in 15,000 German POWs. Start cleaning up the whole city. I'm giving you that word right now. Captain Kiley, what do you think? Well, we'll need to double the size of the courtroom. I have to take out that rear wall and cut into the attic for a visitor's gallery. Saw some terrific seats in an old theater here. Great. Chandelier's got to go. The rest is more practical and let's talk. Palace of Justice is going to see some justice once again. Sir, this was just forwarded from the base. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Uh, Fuchs. Morris Fuchs, Brooklyn, New York. Well, I knew it wasn't Wisconsin with that accent, Fuchs. Thank you. President Truman wants to appoint Francis Biddle as the American judge for the trial. Are you serious? But he already fired Biddle as attorney general. Why would he do that? Guilt, maybe? Probably. I guess it's this instead of a gold watch. How do you feel about that? Well, read Truman's wording. Unless you have a problem with this, which means... I don't have a problem with this. Well, I've got to go back to Washington and brief President Truman anyway. I can stop in Philadelphia along the way and try to cajole Biddle into becoming a team player. When do we leave? I need you to stay here and set up our offices, find us a place to stay. Make those decisions without you? Oh, that'll be fine. I trust you. Bob? Uh, Bob? Your name is Carl, get your ass on the truck. Von Papen. Sure. When we board the plane, get a seat by the window, dear boy. It may be the last view we have of the fatherland. Alfred Yodel, von Chirac, Omar Schack, Rosenberg, von Neurath, Frick, Sockel, Albert Speer, William Kaiser. I couldn't face going back into private practice. Not after all those years in Washington, the nerve center of the country, the war. What is the current status in Nuremberg? Well, we're gathering evidence, choosing defendants. We've settled on 22 men. We've narrowed our targets to those who ran the concentration camps. Good thinking, splendid. The ones who gathered the slave labor as well as those that used it. Absolutely. Absolutely right. The judges will have a great deal of work ahead of them with the pretrial discovery. Yes, yes, yes. Well, of course, you'll be there to guide me through it. I'm thrilled, Bob. It's an honor. This means a great deal to me. Am I safe in calling the president and telling him that you've signed off on me, that I'm approved as chief American judge? I'll arrange your flight this week. We need you over there as quickly as possible. We need to gear up fast. The trial's in one month. <clears throat> we'll have dessert in Nuremberg. POW is carrying pickaxes. That's why you got a bodyguard. Just let one of them try and mess with you. You want the desk sideways? No, life from the side gives him a headache. Well, you, uh, you really take good care of this guy. Well, that's my job. That's fine? Perfect. Oh, could you please find Captain Kiley? I want to know if the filing cabinets are ready. Sure thing. The first thing you must understand about these men is that they are war criminals. Their rank means nothing. There is to be no exchanging of salutes or any other military courtesy. Now, I know most of you men saw combat. You lost friends, companions. We've all seen the bodies at the side of the road. Men who gave their lives in the service of their country. Gave their lives so that we might have the opportunity to bring these criminals to justice. Now, our job is to make sure that these criminals survive long enough 
to have that justice served. To make sure that our friends, our companions, did not die in vain. That'll be all. Stand Swab yourself. I beg your pardon. Their bucket and their mop. Use them. Pick it up. Pick them up now. Pick them up. now, his heartbeat was up to almost 300 beats a minute. Couldn't let the heart fail you. That's just great. That's just what I need. To lose the biggest bull in the round. Lieutenant. Wheelis, sir. I'm making this man your personal responsibility. He is not to exert himself. As God is my witness, he will be in the best of health when they hang him. Yes, sir. Yes. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Ellis, with your permission, I shall call you Lieutenant. That's fine, sir. Good. Huh. Thanks for the ride, Fuchs. No problem. Robert! Welcome back. Nice to be back. It's really good to have you back. So. Quite a job you've done here. You should see the inside. Come on. Excellent work. Captain, uh... Kylie. Kylie. What's your background, Kylie? A couple of architecture classes. Never got a degree. Neither did I. <laughs> Are you serious? You're a justice of the Supreme Court. You know, I practiced law for 20 years with only a single year of law school under my belt. Things were a lot easier back then. Shouldn't go around giving away your secrets. I won't tell if you won't tell. How are we making out with these gizmos for the simultaneous translation? IBM sort of inventing the process as we go, sir, but we'll be ready for you. I promise. I don't doubt that. Excuse me. Question is, will we be ready? The whole team's waiting in your office. They'll fill you in. I missed you. I missed you, too. You know, when I was home, I couldn't find a phone number. I couldn't find a document. Well, now you won't have to worry about that. I'll take care of it. Should be fun. Tom, I'd like you to do Spear. My pleasure. I'd also like you to take on Shurok and Funk. Good. Are the indictments ready to be served? Yeah. I say we hold off until the last possible moment. Until they're indicted, we get to treat them like POWs. We can interrogate them all day long. Once they're indicted... Once they're indicted, they're entitled to have their lawyers present. Fellas, this is going to be a fair trial. Let's serve those indictments as soon as possible. If the British deliver the indictments, wouldn't be right for us to hug the whole show now. Uh, what if the defendants want Nazi lawyers? Oh, hell no. What kind of crazy example would that set? Free speech? For crying out loud, boys. Nazis defending Nazis when they ought to be on trial themselves. And we're gonna pay them? I can't help wondering what these fellows would do if the situation was reversed and they had us on trial. Well, we don't have to answer that question in this room right now. The judges will be here in one week. We'll let them decide. Would you excuse me for a moment? Yeah. It's just 
just arrived from Bill. He's decided not to fly. He's coming over on the Queen Elizabeth. He'll be here in three weeks. I'm a bit surprised at Biddle. I'd never seen a man so hungry for approval. Well, yeah, but then you approved him, Bob. I did learn a lesson there, didn't I? And how I hate learning lessons. Don't you think this is a little bit excessive? I got it for a really good price. Justice Jackson, meet Frau Hassel and Herr Hassel. Willkommen. How do you do? I have lived five years in America. Oh, well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Frau uh, Hassel. Uh, please come in. Follow me, bitte, bitte. I will prepare dinner, something light, perhaps, at this hour. Thank you. Light means five pounds of lard in the dumplings instead of six. So who owns this place? Some banker who no longer owns a bank. I think we're his only source of income now. Mm. Come on. Oh, thank you, Herr Hassel. I'll do that. Uh, Dr. Schumann. So where is your room? Upstairs. It's a cute little attic apartment type thing. Is it all right? Well, it's nicer than what I have in Washington, Bob. Well, I haven't seen what you have in Washington. Oh, God, I am so bushed. Just hold on till dinner. Uh, would you like a drink? No, maybe later on. Oh, don't do that. Mm. Well, I've arranged a little breakfast meeting with the team tomorrow morning. Good, good. Just to go over some of the finer points. Mm-hmm. Wow, you sure pack well, Bob. Ah, oh, Bob. <laughs> Of it. Do just fine, old chap. Open up. Good morning. I am Major Neve. I'm the officer appointed by the International Military Tribunal to serve upon the Wait, wait. You're British? I am. Finally, a civilized man. Neve. What is your given name? Airy. Airy. Major Airy Neve. I have heard this name before. Airy, like the wind. Why? Why would I have heard this name? I was captured, tortured by the Gestapo, and escaped twice. Oh, I see. You've earned your given name. <laughs> I am the officer appointed by the International Military Tribunal to serve upon you a copy of the indictment in which you are named as defendant. I'm also here to advise you as to your rights to counsel. I care nothing for lawyers. You can find one for me, Major Airy of the Wind. We're men of culture. We both know the truth. The victors will always be the judges. The vanquished, always the accused. Yes? this I cannot speak to the accuracy of the charges against me but I acknowledge the necessity of this trial and accept 
my inclusion in it. How can you say that before reading the charges? There's a common responsibility for the crimes that were committed in the name of the Third Reich. No one is blameless, apart from the victims. But we were just following orders. I know nothing about crimes against humanity. Here's a list of lawyers. Jews. No, Julians! I want to be defended by a German naval officer. I was a lawyer myself, full of ideals. Why don't you just shoot us now? Why don't you just shoot us now? guard posted at the porthole of every cell. There to be watched around the clock. I will not have them taking me anywhere. I need to pick up a document from the document room. I'll meet you in the office. Find any directives on Polish slave labor? Oh, take your pick. You know, there's something peculiar about the German character that makes them keep detailed records of every damn thing they do. It's downright perverse. The Nazis put into right every criminal thought they ever had and every criminal act they ever did. Right here in this room is enough evidence to hang half the country. I'll settle for 21 clean convictions. Yeah. I expect we'll be here quite late, Carl Oswald. Don't worry about dinner. We'll manage on our own. Thank you. Get what you need? More than. Um, I've arranged all your random notes for the opening statement into something less random. Legal, thematic, anecdotal, precedent, theory. You really are something, you know that? Well, when you decide what, let me know. Oh, my God. I've noticed that this case has really inspired the orator in you. Well, I've tried to capture a, uh, a tone, a mood. A melancholy grandeur, if you will? Well, it's all here. You have a... Uh, something right here. We only have two days left to finish the speech. Maybe you should start dictating. Simultaneous translation business, like taking a room in the Tower of Babel. <laughs> and this, I can assure you, whoever designed those electronic earmuffs... Yep, earphones, Sir Geoffrey. <laughs> earphones. Whoever designed them did not try them over a barrister's wig. Uh, well, not to worry, I knew they'll be most becoming. <laughs> <laughs> to change my style. Who's that over there? He's a psychologist. The army transferred him over here to consult on the suicide risk of the prisoners.
Francis, I had arranged for a flight to pick you up. You were meant to be here two weeks ago. What happened? You developed a sudden craving for shuffleboard? <laughs> I just needed a little time to get myself up to speed. I worked the whole way over. I'm fully prepared. Any of my colleagues here? I'd like to meet them. Uh, perhaps later on. I need to talk to you about something. Huh. You must drink some vodka. No, 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 thank you. Oh, you must try some. It makes it very strong. The cognac. Oh. But we do it all you the time. Know, you can't mix it. Oh, we do in Russia all the time. Not in France. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Look at this part. It was a gift from my family. After the trial, I'm going to donate this along with my papers to my alma mater. I think future generations. Francis. Will... On the subject of who will serve as president of the court, now, the British are prepared to support you, but. Uh, Yes. But it's not in the best interest of the trial. The Americans are far too dominant in this thing already. The trial must be viewed as a joint effort. I really do have the qualifications. I know you do. If not me, then who? Sir Geoffrey Lawrence. The British share our sensibilities, and it's a hell of a lot better than having Devob or God knows Nikachenko. I think I can sell the French on this idea, too. Everyone back home assumes that I will be head of the court. Francis, your role here will be of incredible importance. This is probably the last appointment of my career, Bob. This is how I'm going out with great honor. Francis, you will be capping your career with great honor. Lazed at himself in. <laughs> Who should we get to replace him in the dock? <laughs> it's not a Broadway show, Johnny. We don't just bring out an understudy. <laughs> We've still got 21 left. 21's a good solid number. Boys, they're coming back. Oh, little Biddle doesn't look too happy. Well, can you blame him? Gentlemen, if I may, I'd like to introduce Judge Francis Biddle. Oh, so Sir Jeffrey Lawrence. Yes, I'm delighted to do so. Judge Devon. David Maxwell Price. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a salute to my colleagues in the law. How fortunate we are to be in a profession where we may speak our minds, and not like diplomats who must behave like dogs on a leash. <laughs> <laughs> to the law. To the law. I was wondering if you'd care to dance with me. I'm not much of a dancer. Well, let's go embarrass ourselves. My opinion, head shrinking has no place in this man's army. But you've been assigned to me, Captain, and I plan to make full use of you. But you're gonna help me make sure I don't lose any more of my prisoners. Well, from what I already know of your setup here, Colonel, I can safely say that you've created the perfect suicide ward. What are you talking about? These men have nothing to do all day but sit around and think about their fate. Well, they should think about it. Well, if you want to keep them alive and sane, you need to keep them occupied, both mentally and physically. Small library, for instance. Library? A library would make all the difference in the world, so would an exercise yard. Well, I had something quite different in mind. I thought I might put you in their life, give them somebody to talk to, open up with. I'm sure they'll jump at the chance to jibber-jabber with somebody as bright and enthusiastic as yourself. They'll tell you what they're thinking, what they're planning. And you report everything you hear to me. Colonel. I, I don't want to hear anything about morals and ethics, Captain. These men are prisoners. Criminals, not patients. That's the deal, Captain. Take it or leave it. The library in the exercise yard, sir. You got it.
place is worse than I expected. What a nightmare. Where do we pick up our press passes? The Palace of Justice. What's the metal bar in the front of the jeep do? Works like a knife to cut the wires that Germans string across the road at night. Several GIs have already been decapitated. Lovely. Here we are, gentlemen. I'll take your bags to the hotel. All right, thanks a lot, buddy. See you around. Press credentials ready to show. You will be given press passes and transferred to assigned lodging. Get in line, gentlemen, get in line. Check this out. Vita, Vita, nice and tight, yes, please. Das ist Dankeschön. Berlin, Berlin, die ewig junge Stadt. Das ist Berlin, Berlin, die meine Liebe hat. Genau im Mittelpunkt der Welt hat sie der Herr Gott hier Rudolf, you put it on the wrong foot. What? The shoe. Yeah, yeah. This seems completely mad. It is an act. He is being clever. If he was so clever, he wouldn't have spent the last four years in an English prison. <laughs> I turned my diaries over to the Americans, voluntarily. You see, they proved that I tried to resign as Governor General of Poland. I did not approve of the persecution of the Jews. Anyone reading my diaries, they will know what was in my heart. They will understand that those things I wrote about the Jews, the orders I signed, they were not sincere. I believe you, Herr Frank. And yet, you did do those things. How do you explain it? I don't mean legally, I'm not a lawyer or a judge. I mean, how do you explain it to yourself? I don't know. It's as though I'm two people. The Hans Frank you see here, and Hans Frank, the Nazi leader. I wonder how that other Frank could do those things. This Frank looks at that Frank and says, You're a terrible man. And what does that Frank say back? He says, I just wanted to keep my job. Friends, friends, when we begin this grotesque farce tomorrow, my friends, Never forget that we are here for one reason, and one reason only. We lost the war. But someday, a grateful German nation will honor our legacy. <laughs> Doctor, what do you have? You have one German. You have a fine man. Two Germans. A punt. Three Germans. A war. <laughs> Are you really in such a good mood, Herr Goering? Or is this your way of handling fear? Fear? What do I have to be afraid of? I have ordered hundreds and thousands of men into battle knowing full well that not many would return. Why should I, their leader, tremble when called upon to face the enemy? I know that I am a condemned man. That is of no consequence. There is still work to be done. And mark my words, it will be done. One Englishman, an idiot. Two Englishmen, a club. Three Englishmen, an empire. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I spoke with some of the translators today. To get a sense of the pace you need to maintain, it's a little tricky because it's not just about pace, it's about rhythm, pausing at the end of phrases. We should probably rehearse a little tonight. Not the whole speech, you need to save your voice for tomorrow. Good morning, Lieutenant Willis. Morning, sir. It's time to go, Rags Marshal. How do I look? You look fine, sir. How do you feel? Excited. I've waited many months, many months of silence. Now, at last, I'm being heard. Shall we? I'm not allowed to do that, sir. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Bring him up. Sergeant, search the cells. <laughs> Sir Jeffrey, with my respects.
This trial, which is now to begin, is unique in the annals of jurisprudence. The defendants, all having been served with copies of the indictments, are now to enter their pleas. Hermann Goering. I have a statement which I will now read to the court. The defendants are not to make a speech. They are only to enter a plea. I declare myself in the sense of the indictment, nicht schuldig, not guilty. Rudolf Hess. Nein. Nein. Record that as not guilty. Joachim von Ribbentrop. Nicht schuldig. Wilhelm Keitel. Nicht schuldig. Ernst Kaltenbrunner. Ich bekenne mich nicht schuldig. Alfred Rosenberg. Nicht schuldig. Hans Frank. Nicht schuldig. Wilhelm Frick. Nicht schuldig. Julius Streicher. Nicht schuldig. Walter Funk. Nicht schuldig. Hjalmar Schacht. Nicht schuldig. Karl Dönitz. Nicht schuldig. Erich Reder. Nicht schuldig. Baldur von Schirach. Nicht schuldig. Fritz Sauko. Nicht schuldig. Alfred Jodl. Nicht schuldig. Franz von Pappen. Nicht schuldig. Arthur Seis Ingwart. Nicht schuldig. Albert Speer. Nicht schuldig. Konstantin von Neurath. Nicht schuldig. And Hans Fritscher. Nicht schuldig. All the pleas have now been entered. Justice Jackson. Your opening address, please. May it please your honors. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. That four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. If these men are the first war leaders of a defeated nation to be prosecuted in the name of the law, we agree that here they must be given a presumption of innocence. And we accept the burden of proving criminal acts and the responsibility of these defendants for their commission. We have no purpose here to incriminate the whole German people. Hitler did not achieve power by a majority of vote, but seized it by an evil alliance of revolutionists, reactionaries, and militarists. You will hear today and in the days ahead of the enormity and the horror of their acts. The prosecution will give you undeniable proofs of these incredible events. I count myself as one who received, during this war, most atrocity tales with suspicion or skepticism. No more. The catalog of crimes will omit nothing that could be conceived by their pathological pride, cruelty, and lust for power. You will hear of the repression of organized labor, the harassment of the church, persecution of the Jews, the conversion of mere anti-Semitism into the deliberate extermination of the Jews of Europe. You will hear of the long series of German aggressions and conquests and broken treaties, the terror that settled over Germany, the havoc wrought on the occupied territories, and you will know that the real complaining party at your bar is civilization. Civilization asks whether law is so laggard as to be utterly helpless to deal with crimes of this magnitude by criminals of this order of importance. It does not expect that you can make war impossible. 
It does expect that your juridical action will put the forces of international law, its precepts, its prohibitions, and above all, its sanctions, on the side of peace, so that men and women of goodwill in all countries may have leave to live by no man's leave underneath the law. The court is now adjourned. Jackson's speech, pedantic. Tires him lot of nothing. I nodded off twice. Well, the food is better today. You think they'll feed us like this every day? They always feed you well before they hang you. Yeah, that's so true. They can't hang us. We're soldiers. They have to shoot us. Please! Stop this talk. We must concentrate on our defense. If you're not going to eat, Frank, give it to me. It's a crime to wear such good food. <laughs> Look what they have done to your beautiful city. Nuremberg is not mine. But it was. Was anything ever more extraordinary than the Partei Tag in your stage here every September? The night skies would light up like a bonfire as we carried our torches through the streets, a quarter million of us on the way to the Zeppelin heaves. I remember standing there for hours, basking in the radiance of the Fuhrer. And then I would take a group of my Hitler young to the river where we bathed together. We had to cool off from the fires that were burning within us. But now that just seems like a dream. A strange, wonderful, frightening dream. It was not a dream. It was a nightmare of our own making, and it's time to wake up from it. The look in Hitler's eyes was not radiance. It was madness. Is the British prosecution ready? Yes, indeed we are. Uh, your honors, with your permission, I wish to read from a sworn affidavit by one Hermann Friedrich Graeber, a German construction manager who, in a, a civilian capacity, was employed by the German army in occupied Ukraine from 1941 to 1944. On several occasions, he uh, observed the mass murders of local Jews committed by the SS or Schutzstaffel, the uh, Nazi party's police and security organization. One such occasion, he writes, took place on October the 5th, 1942, near the city of Dobno. That morning, Herr Grebe was informed that all 5,000 Jews from that city were to be taken by SS trucks to a place near his building site where they were to be shot and buried in large pits. He continues. Thereupon I drove to the site and saw near it great mounds of earth. Several SS trucks stood in front of them. I heard rifle shots in quick succession coming from behind one of the earth mounds. Those who had just got off the trucks, men, women, and children of all ages, had to undress upon the order of an SS man who carried a whip. All these people had the regulation yellow patches on their clothes and thus could be recognized as Jews. And without screaming or weeping, these people undressed, stood around in family groups, kissed each other, said their farewells. I watched a family of about eight, a man and a woman with their children and two grown-up daughters. An old woman with snow-white hair was holding the youngest, perhaps one year old, in her arms and singing to it and, and tickling it. And the, the child was cooing with delight. 
All the people around were looking on with tears in their eyes. The father was holding the hand of a boy about 10 years old and uh, speaking to him softly. And the boy was fighting his tears. The father pointed to the sky, stroked the boy's head and seemed to explain something to him. At that moment, the SS man at the pit shouted to his comrades. The latter counted off about 30 persons and instructed them to go behind the earth monk. Among them was the family that I have mentioned. I well remember a girl, slim and with black hair, who, as she passed close to me, pointed to herself and said, 23. I then walked around the mound and found myself confronted by an enormous grave. People were closely wedged together and lying on top of each other so that only their heads were visible. Nearly all had blood running over their shoulders. Some of the people shot were still moving. Some were lifting their arms and turning their heads to show that they were still alive. The pit was at least two-thirds full. I estimated that it already contained about 1,000 humans. The victims, completely naked, went down some steps which were cut out of the clay wall of the pit and clambered over the heads of the people lying there to the place where the SS man had directed them. They lay down in front of the dead or injured. Some caressed those who were still alive and spoke to them in low voices. Then I heard a series of shots. I looked back into the pit and saw that the bodies were twitching and the heads lying already motionless were on top of the bodies that lay beneath them. When I walked back around the mound, I noticed another truckload which had just arrived. This time it included the sick and the infirm. An old very thin, very frail woman, with terribly thin legs, was undressed by the others who were already naked while two people held her up. The, the woman was obviously paralyzed. The naked people carried the old woman around the mound and the shooting continued. Signed, Friedrich Graeber. Did any of you ever hear of this Graeber? Huh? On the contrary, we had an excellent lunch, nice view of the city, and in the courtroom, we had the best seats in the house. <laughs> they go on about this grabby person. It doesn't concern us. We were not even mentioned. We must have very little evidence against us. Hmm? I always suspected the British prosecutor was a Jew. Now I am sure. Shut up, Saka! Please, Commissar Maeve. We're on trial. Of course, they're going to say terrible things about us. They have not even begun. Lock them up! Happy dreams, Leutnant. Good night, Reich, Marshal. Your Honors, I would like to read into the record document 294 PS, which describes manpower initiatives and how they were directed. Mr. Justice Jackson. You have already read into record eight nearly identical documents on this subject. Do you really feel it necessary to introduce a ninth? I do. Yes, Your Honor, I do. Very well. Please continue. 
Document 294 PS begins as follows. Lieutenant, I have come to the conclusion that the sentences are already being carried out. Justice Jackson means to bore us to death, and he is succeeding beyond his fondest hopes. Now the Fuhrer, ah, what a speaker. At a rally here in Nuremberg, he held an audience of 250,000 people in the palm of his hand for an entire afternoon. As legal strategy, your documentary approach has been unassailable. But as drama, it is, I regret to say, absolutely stultifying. Well, as you know, it's not meant to be an entertainment. It's meant to be a trial. And it's ours to lose. A trial is a show, Robert. And like it or not, it's a show. And those four learned men sitting on the bench are as impressionable as any audience. You're pushing for witnesses? Witnesses will give this trial a human face. One compelling witness can outweigh a ton of documentary evidence. Mr. Petchleg, while you were imprisoned at Dachau, were you at one time asked to participate in a medical experiment? Yes. And the Nazi doctor who supervised that experiment, Dr. Rascher, did he ever explain to you its purpose? He said the Luftwaffe had a problem, that its pilots shot down over the North Sea often survived the crash into freezing waters only to die later after being rescued. The purpose of the experiment was to prevent these deaths. And what experiment did he devise? First, I helped to strip other male inmates naked and put them into water tanks. You were forced to do this to fellow inmates? Yes. And then? Then we added large pieces of ice. We put thermometers into their rectums to make sure the men were freezing. Then some of them we plunged into hot water, others in warm water, others we put next to naked female inmates so the doctor could learn which method would best revive them. Mr. Packerleg, would you be so kind as to read this conclusion from Dr. Rasher's meticulous records? Rapid rewarming was in all cases preferable to slow rewarming because after removal from the cold water, the body temperature continued to drop rapidly. Rewarming by animal warmth was too slow. Thank you. Mr. Pakaleg, do you recall whatever became of the subjects of Dr. Rasher's experiments on behalf of the uh, Luftwaffe? Most of them went into convulsions and died. Thank you. In 1942, I was arrested, interrogated, and then ordered to sign a false confession. I refused. The German officer threatened me. I told him, I'm not afraid of being shot. He said, we have means at our disposal that are far worse than being shot. Please continue, madam. Soon afterwards, I found myself packed with 230 other French women in a sealed train on our way to Auschwitz. A sealed train? No food, no water, nothing. At Auschwitz, the trains ran almost all the way to the gas chamber. They unsealed the cars, and the soldiers let everyone out. I saw men, women, children, old couples forced apart from each other. 
mothers made to abandon their children. None were aware of the fate that awaited them. Those selected for the gas chamber were immediately driven to a red brick building. I saw my friend, Annette, on that truck. She called to me. Think of my little boy if you ever get back to France. Then she put her arms around another Frenchwoman, and they began singing La Marseillaise. One night, we were awakened by horrible cries. The next day, we learned that the Nazis had run out of gas, and the children had been thrown into the furnaces alive. Of the 230 women on that train, how many returned? from Auschwitz. 49. Thank you, madam. You're excused. There you are. The film came in late last night, and I was up until dawn watching it. Now, very few people have seen this film. Bob, you have got to enter this into evidence this morning. What's the film? You're not going to believe this. May it please the tribunal, the United States now offers a film into evidence. It was compiled from motion pictures taken by Allied military photographers as their armies liberated areas into which concentration camps were located. Go.
It was such a nice day, laughing, joking. And then they showed that horrid film. Propaganda, anyone can do it. Little of this, little of that, and before you know it, still. Those films, you know, I'd read any number of affidavits reports, statistics, but I didn't really understand until I saw those films. I still don't understand. I don't think I ever will. How could civilized human beings do that to other civilized human beings? Maybe civilization's overrated. Good night, Lloyd. Good night, Rice Marshal. Schwarzbraunes Mädel, du bleibst zu Hause ein darm Mädel, Mädel, wink, 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 unter einer grünen Lehrling sitzt ein kleiner Fink, 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 ruft nur immer Mädel, ruft nur immer Mädel, Fink, sitzt ein kleiner Fink, 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 ruft nur immer Mädel, Fink, der wird uns folgen. Sie ist ein kleiner Pink, 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 Rotorin, ein Melodie. Sie ist ein kleiner Pink, 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 Rotorin, ein Melodie. Sie ist ein kleiner Pink, 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 Rotorin
Spear, help me understand what I witnessed today in the dining room. Goering's ability to dominate and intimidate without possessing a real shred of power. Yes. Well, how do you explain that? Habit. Instinct. Something in the determined character that responds to authority. Real or imagined. That's it? That's all it is? Yeah. What about the ideas he expressed? The words, the thoughts? They had no impact? What ideas? What thoughts? They were only platitudes. Nazi Germany was built on empty platitudes. A man like you, you were seduced by empty platitudes? Of course, because you can hear in them any meaning you want. You said earlier you wanted to tell me something. I have been trying to encourage some of the other defendants to join with me in accepting guilt and expressing remorse. I made progress with Frank, and I have had high hopes for young von Schirach. But Göring means to bully them into joining him, and I fear now he will succeed, unless someone stops him. I understand. Gary, do you believe that the Nazi party came into power legally? I do. And I'm happy to explain in detail the history of those first elections. But I will add that once we came to power, we were determined to hold on to it under all circumstances. We did not want to leave this any longer to chance, to elections, and to parliamentary majorities. It had always been our plan, once we came to power, that we would eliminate the Reichstag, uh, dissolve the regional parliaments, end individual rights. Where did the idea come from to combine the ceremonial head of state and the head of government in one person, Adolf Hitler? That's quite simple. We took our example from the similar dual roles of the President of the United States. <laughs> and the idea for concentration camps? The idea was mine. It was a question of removing danger. Only one course was available protective custody. How could the party rule until it had established order? And how could it maintain order with its deadly enemies, particularly the communists, running free? No further questions. on his own neck. I don't think he really cares. He's got bigger fish to fry. This guy is talking right over the heads of the tribunal and directly to the German people. I suggest that you isolate Goering from the other defendants when they're not in the courtroom. Open it up. I don't understand. Why are you doing this? Inside. I'm just following orders. Julian Cross, hit Goring quick and hard. Put him on the defensive right away. Never let him breathe. I see no point in that at all. He's blatantly incriminating himself. All I need to do is ask direct questions and let him answer them. Be prepared with a tougher line of questioning, though. Case is needed. Thank you. Sure. Why am I being punished like a schoolboy? Sperr. Sperr's behind this. He must have talked to Colonel Andrus, persuaded him into this line of action. How do you know it wasn't me? Why Dr. Speer? Is there some kind of rivalry between the two of you? He is ashamed of being a Nazi. I am not. 
He wishes to infect the others with his shame. You have no shame. The world has now seen proof of the horrors committed by Nazi Germany. You're comfortable defending every bit of it. I've seen so many horrors already. The carnage of the First War, thousands of my countrymen maimed, degraded, starved. No, my dear doctor. I am not an inhuman monster who has no regard for human life. These atrocities are not indifferent to me. You know, we are accused of so many appalling acts, it is hard to keep track. Did you try? My concern was war. And in war, each nation has its own selfish interest. You have to be practical. I am a practical man. And I'm a soldier. And a soldier's code is obedience. <laughs> Obedience. This amuses him. Blind obedience without responsibility. Is there nobody in this country that will take responsibility for anything? Nobody who can say no. Take a look at every cell in this block. What do you see? Yes, men. All the no men are six feet underground. What is this? You're not Jewish, are you? Yes, I am. I see. Well, this is a very interesting situation for both of us. Will the witness repeat this oath after me? I swear by God, the Almighty and Omniscient. I swear by God, the Almighty and Omniscient. That I will speak the pure truth and will withhold and add nothing. That I will speak the pure truth and will withhold and add nothing. Mr. Chief Prosecutor. You are perhaps aware that you are the only living man who can expound to us the true purposes of the Nazi party and the inner workings of its leadership. I am perfectly aware of that. And you, from the very beginning, together with those who you were associated with, intended to overthrow and later on did overthrow Germany's previous government, the Weimar Republic. That was my firm intention. But upon coming to power, you immediately abolished parliamentary democratic government in Germany. We found it no longer to be necessary. Is it not true that people subsequently were thrown into concentration camps without recourse from the courts? You must distinguish between two categories. Those who had committed some kind of treason against the new state were naturally turned over to the courts. The others whom one might expect such acts, but who had not yet committed them, such as the functionaries of the Communist Party who were attacking us in the thousands. You've answered the question, thank you. I need to explain further. Well, you'll have the opportunity to explain further under re-examination from your own counsel. Now, did you prohibit all yeah. court review of the cause for taking people into what you were calling at the time protective custody? That I answered very clearly, but I should like to make an explanation in connection with my the answer. The counsel will see to that. Now, about the concentration camps. Mr. Justice Jax, the tribunal thinks the witness ought to be allowed to make what explanation he thinks right in answer to this question. The tribunal thinks that you should be permitted to explain your answer now, and it will listen to that explanation. I want to say that I issued a decree that those who were turned over to the concentration camps should be informed after 24 hours of the reason and allowed an attorney after 48 hours. This by no means rescinded my order that a court review of these measures was not permitted. Now, by protective custody, you mean that you were taking people into custody who had not yet committed a crime, but you believed might quite possibly commit a crime in the future? Yes. 
Just as extensive protective measures are being taken in Germany today on I a tremendous I didn't ask you about Germany scale. today. Mr. Justice Jackson. This is poor preparation. The witness may finish his explanation. say that you were against the attack on Soviet Russia, yet you gave no warning to the German people. You brought no pressure to bear to prevent the attack. You did not even resign to protect your place in history. We were at war, and such differences of opinion could not be brought before the public during war. This was the case in your own country. As to your second question. That will suffice. I'm not finished. Secondly. Your Honor, please. The witness must be allowed to have his say. Secondly, as far as my resignation is concerned, I do not wish even to discuss that. For I was an officer, a soldier. I served my country. Now I ask you Thirdly, this. Your I Honor, was not, please. Thirdly, I was not the man to forsake someone to whom I had given my oath of loyalty every time he was not to my way of thinking. Your Honor. It never, ever occurred to me to leave the Fuhrer. Your Honor, the witness is adopting a contemptuous attitude toward this tribunal, which is giving him the trial that he never gave a living soul nor dead ones either. No objection, Your Honor. I'm ready for the next question. I think this is probably a good point to adjourn for the day. Tough calls from the bench. Well, it's only round one. If you think you need anything, don't forget, I'm here. As the week ends, there's a consensus among all present that Hermann Goering now appears to be in control of the court. Will Jackson, will anyone be able to stop him? Yes, Bob. You know, Judge, I didn't leave the Supreme Court to come here and be thwarted by a fellow countryman. That sounds like sour grapes. Very unbecoming. To an outsider, it might appear like you were deliberately trying to sabotage me. Bob. You gave Gehring an open forum during direct examination. I must be able to control him during cross. Listen, Bob. Just accept the fact that you weren't at the top of your game today. You have the weekend to prepare for the next round. Make good use of it. Not hungry, sir. Oh, I'm too excited to eat. Did you hear what I said? My reply when he asked me why I did not resign? I lectured him about loyalty. You should have seen Jackson's face, his face. Well, it was a totally foreign concept to him. <laughs> you know, if I didn't know better, I would say Jackson was a Jew. <laughs> no, no, keep it, keep it. My initials, see, engraved. That's real nice. I'm never gonna forget this. I know, Lieutenant, I know. Hmm. Sit down. You know, my friends call me Tex. All right, Tex. 
<laughs> Let me tell you something, Tex. America will soon learn that they are backing the wrong philosophy here. We should both be together fighting the forces of communism. You think? Oh, yeah. You think? Yeah. 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 I think we both think, huh? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to dictate a telegram. President Harry S. Truman, the White House. Mr. President, please accept my resignation as chief prosecutor for the Nuremberg trials. Bob? And appoint a replacement at the earliest possible... Bob, I'm not writing this. I won't. You saw today that I'm not up to this task. Now I could stay out of pride and unravel everything that we've all worked so hard to accomplish here, or I could step aside. Bob, you are this trial. Everything it is, everything it represents is from inside you. Your thoughts, your values. I tasted failure today. And realized what that would mean, not only to myself, but to everyone connected with this proceeding. The only way they can triumph over you is if their values are stronger than yours. If they believe in their ideals more than you believe in yours. Is that true, Bob? Does Hermann Goering actually believe in his ideals more than you believe in yours? Now, look here. What, what happened wasn't entirely your fault. I mean, God knows I'd be hard-pressed to defeat a clever defendant who's allowed to say whatever he wants for as long as he wants. Well, now that you've finished with the niceties, let's have the truth. Well, it was very damaging, Robert. I mean, you've introduced this trial from a position of moral superiority, and as a result, you've become its chief symbol. Now, if you can't maintain that, or if the balance shifts ever so slightly, it could be a disaster. Hermann Goering is using this trial to present himself as a philosopher statesman on the level of Hitler. Do you see Goering as a statesman? No, I do not. I see him as reprehensible, as inhuman. Then treat him as such. Treat him as the vile, conniving, bloody, fascist bastard that he is. All right, where the hell is he? He'll be here. Mr. Chief Prosecutor, if you're ready. From the very beginning, you regarded the elimination of the Jews from the economic life of Germany as under your jurisdiction, did you not? Yeah. Elimination from economic life. That is partly correct. Uh, large industries, also armed industries, under Jewish directives. Was that the first of your legal measures against the Jews? I believe removal from office was first in 1933. Then, in 1936, you personally drafted an act 
making it punishable by death to transfer property abroad? That is correct. And another, that all damage caused to Jewish property by the anti-Jewish riots of 1938 must be repaired by Jews at their own expense with their insurance claims forfeited to the right. I did sign a similar law, but it was exactly the same way. And did you not say about those riots, I show you this transcript, did you not say, I wish you had killed 200 Jews instead of destroying such valuables? That was said in a moment of bad temper and extreme excitement. Spontaneous sincerity, in other words. Did you not also personally sign a decree in September 1940 ordering seizure of all Jewish property in Poland? I assume so, if the decree is there. And another which provided that Jews receive no compensation for damages caused by enemy attacks or by German forces. If the law bears my name, then it must be so. Is this your signature? It appears to be. Is it or is it not your signature? It is. Your signature on a decree dated July 1941 asking Himmler and Heydrich and the SS to make plans for the final solution of the Jewish question. That is not a proper translation. I said total solution, not the final solution. These are your words to Himmler. I charge you to send me before long an overall plan concerning the organizational, factual, and material measures necessary for the desired solution of the Jewish question. Is that an accurate translation of what is written in this order from you to Heydrich and Himmler? That had to do with immigration and evacuation of the Jews. And you ordered all other government agencies to cooperate with the SS in the final solution of the Jewish question, did you not? There's nothing in there about the SS. This document states you personally ordered all government agencies to cooperate with the SS. You sent this letter to SS Gruppenfuhrer Heydrich. That doesn't mean that the SS had anything to do with the solution to the Jewish question. say this clearly. I did not know anything that took place or the methods that were used in the concentration camps later. These things were kept secret from me. And I might add that in my opinion, even the Fuhrer did not know the extent to what was happening. Witness, there is evidence before this court that nearly 10 million people have been exterminated. Murdered in cold blood. You mean to say that you did not, and in your opinion, Hitler did not know what took place in the concentration camps? Yeah. Do you know that Hitler said in 1943, in a recorded meeting, I read you his words now, quote, the Reich's Minister of Foreign Affairs declared that the Jews should be exterminated or taken to concentration camps. There is no other possibility. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ribbentrop, talked with Hitler about extermination. And you were above Ribbentrop. You were Hitler's second in command. You were in charge of the economic four-year plan, so you knew all about the gold wedding rings and the gold teeth and the gold eyeglasses that the victims left behind. And you have heard that it took five extra minutes to kill the women because they had to cut their hair off to be used in making mattresses. And nothing was told to you about this material that came from these people that had been murdered? No! No! How can you imagine such a thing? I was laying down the broad outlines of the German economy. The witness is excused. I am not finished. The witness is excused. I am not finished. The witness is excused.
Know what would have been a great touch? Herman Goering showing up in a Santa outfit. <laughs> well, he'd probably do it. After all, he was the Third Reich's chief bon vivant. Mm. Did you ever see pictures of Goering at Hitler's mountain retreat? Dressed like a Tyrolean chorus boy out of some grotesque <laughs> operetta. Leaving so soon? Some of the defendants asked me to come by tonight on Christmas Eve chat with their rabbi. You know, the trial is about to enter a new phase, a very important one, in which the defendants will have to choose between stonewalling and evading or taking responsibility for their actions. Now, you are the best chance we have to influence that choice. Here, Hassel. Пожалуйста. Frau Hassel, is something wrong? Do not ask me to serve the Russians, please. But there are guests. My son was killed on the Russian front. Okay, I'll take care of this. Go to the kitchen. Try these little sausage things, General. Uh, forget what Frau Hassel calls them, but I hear they're mighty tasty. Madam, 20 million of my people were killed by the Germans. You think I could be offended by the snub of a Hausfrau? I don't know what to think, General. Frankly, I can't keep track of all the politics in this room. <laughs> Russians sure don't disappear in a crowd, do they? <laughs> no, they suffered more in this war than any other country. It must be doubly painful to attract such little sympathy for it. <laughs> And Jackson decreed no wives could come along. Worked out quite nicely for him, wouldn't you say? I figure it's probably their last Christmas in here. Merry Christmas, Colonel.
Marshal. Doctor, how are you? I'm so glad that you are here. Please, sit. You are the only one I can really talk to. But you don't talk to me, Field Marshal. Not really. I tell you everything about my family. Yes, but not about you. I would like to understand how a man like you, a man of your background, could have drafted an instrument like the Commando Order. Allied soldiers found behind enemy lines were shot rather than captured. Or the Night and Fog Decree, suspected resistance members were arrested in the middle of the night and secretly murdered. Because of you. I know. I am dying of shame. Don't you think it's time you admitted that to the rest of the world? were signing orders that broke international laws and treaties. How could you not question what you were doing? Does the lieutenant say to his captain, just a minute, sir, I have to consult the Hague Convention to see if I am allowed to carry out your orders. If we had disobeyed, we would have been arrested. Undrightly so. And you realize without the support of his generals, Herr Yodel, Hitler could not have waged war. It is a soldier's duty to obey orders. That is a code I have lived by all my life. And that code extends to the people who ran the death camps? I'm sorry, sir. Oh, thanks. Thanks, my friend. Come in. Thank come you. in. Come in. <laughs> Sit down. Sit down. Thank you. Oh, it's good to see you. <laughs> I know that uh, Christmas time can be a lonely thing away from home. Merry Christmas, Rex Marshall. Oh, my dear Tex. What luxury. Huh? Prost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what would you be doing now, eh? Back in Texas. Well, on Christmas morning, we'd uh, open our presents mm -hmm. and then go to church. And after that, we'd head over to Grandma and Grandpa's for a big roast turkey dinner. After that, Dad, Grandpa, and me, we go out back hunting for pheasant, quail. Ah, hunting. Hunting was my passion. I was Germany's chief gamekeeper. No kidding. Oh, the shooting around my estates at Cowan Hall was wonderful. Did Hitler ever go hunting with you? I shouldn't tell you this, but uh, Hitler did not approve of hunting. He felt that killing animals was immoral. He was a vegetarian, you know. Yeah? Oh, yes, he was a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that did not stop him from being the most gracious host in Europe. Oh, his dinner parties were legend, always the finest caviar, champagne. Although he did not partake, he was not intolerant. He would uh, dazzle his guests with every view under the sun until dawn. <laughs> I remember, I remember once we were celebrating the triumph of Compiègne, where we savored the sweet revenge of the French having surrendered in the very same railway car that the Germans had capitulated in in 1918, you know. That must have been something. Oh, it was. Believe me. It was. 
You know, Rex, I have made my career as a military man. And I have to say, you remind me of some of the finest young German soldiers who served under me. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Hello, America. As Christmas descends upon this sad and broken city, I'm here inside her great palace of justice. And on this Christmas Eve, as we're filled with thoughts of peace on Earth, it is here that the future of peace may well be determined. Herr von Ribbentrop, would you agree that as foreign minister, you forced Czechoslovakia to surrender its territory by the most intolerable threats of aggression? I do not agree. Well, you threatened to send your army in, in overwhelming strength, and also bomb Prague. What further pressure could you possibly have put upon them? War, for instance. War? <laughs> what is that but war? Ribbentrop should be hanged for his stupidity. That is the greatest crime of all. <laughs> In your newspaper, Herr Schreiker, you wrote that the Jews are a nation of bloodsuckers and extortionists. Do you think that that's preaching race hatred? No, I do not think it's preaching race hatred. It is simply a statement of fact! Dr. Funk, you were president of the Reich Bank during the war. I was, yes. And you accepted unusual deposits into your bank, didn't you? I do not know what you refer to. I am referring to the deposits sent to you by the SS from concentration camps. I, uh, I have no knowledge Inside of... Inside the Reich Bank vaults, there were literally piles of jewelry. Gold watches, gold earrings, gold eyeglass frames, and gold teeth. Many people deposit valuables in the bank, and the bank is not required to look into them. Prior to 1939, exactly how many of your customers deposited their teeth into your bank? You've heard a guard at Mauthausen concentration camp testify that you watched while the gas chamber was demonstrated on inmates. I never set foot in Mauthausen. And we have heard eyewitness testimony from three people that you were at Mauthausen three times. They are lying. And before he died, the commandant at Mauthausen signed this statement that you ordered him to put 65,000 Jews in a tunnel and seal it off rather than allow them to be liberated by the Allies. He is lying! And is it not a fact that you are simply lying to the tribunal about this as you have lied about everything else in your testimony? That is also a lie! Calton Brunner has asked the Commandant of Auschwitz to testify in his defense. If that's a joke, I don't get it. I don't get it either, but it's no joke. The British have him in custody, and they've agreed to transfer him here to testify. Maybe Calton Brunner just figures he'll look better by comparison. Wait a minute. We're not really going to allow this, are we? Let the guy walk in, say God knows what on the stand, give Calton Brunner an alibi? Might be a cheap price to pay, though, for the opportunity to cross-examine him later on. During the entire time you were commandant of Auschwitz, did Ernst Carlton Brunner ever visit the camp? No. Not once? Never. Thank you. One minute, please. Mr. Haus, how long were you the commandant of Auschwitz concentration camp? From the beginning. And what was its purpose? At that time, 
to house prisoners who were being held in protective custody. And after that? I was called to Berlin by my boss, Reichsführer Himmler, in 1941, and he informed me that the Führer had ordered the final solution of the Jewish question. I was not sure what I was supposed to do, so Adolf Eichmann advised me to visit a camp at Treblinka to learn from its operation. And what did you learn there? Actually, I was not impressed. It was taking the commandant there six months to eliminate 80,000 Jews using monoxide gas. I had a better idea. One of my Auschwitz guards had accidentally sniffed a chemical disinfectant called Zyklon B, and had passed out immediately. It occurred to me, if a little of this chemical killed lice, enough, perhaps, would kill a human. I tested it on Soviet prisoners of war locked in a room, and it worked. Within three to 15 minutes, they were dead. And then? I built gas chambers to accommodate 2,000 inmates at a time, compared to Treblinka's 200. And I built four large ovens to cremate the remains. It became possible to eliminate 10,000 people in 24 hours. But that was at peak operation, which was exhausting for my staff. On the average, we would dispatch 2,000 people a day. How many men did it take to dispatch 2,000 people a day? I had a staff of approximately 3,000 men. And during your tenure at Auschwitz, how many people did you dispose of in this fashion? Approximately two and a half million. No further questions. I wish to make this clear. I did not tolerate gratuitous cruelty. My men were there to exterminate people, not torment them. Any misconduct by the guards was punished. I can assure you. The witness is excused. Court is adjourned until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Even while doing this extermination work, I would say I led a perfectly normal family life. How would you describe that life? I've always been happiest alone. I never had any real intimacy with my parents, with my sisters. Commandant, do you feel that the Jews you murdered deserved their fate? I have always been taught that the Jew was an enemy of Germany. So when you were ordered to turn your prison camp into a death camp, you never once thought what you were doing was wrong. I was an SS man. We were trained to obey orders without thinking. Does a rat catcher think it is wrong to kill rats? A rat catcher catching rats. Is that the kind of thinking it takes to carry out state-sanctioned mass murder? Not just blind obedience, but also a belief that your victims are not human. Let me ask you this. What was Hiroshima? Was it not your medical experiment? Would Americans have dropped bombs as easily on Germany as it did upon Japan, killing as many civilians as possible? I think not. To an American sensibility, a Caucasian child is considerably more human than a Japanese child. America was at war with Japan, a country that had attacked it without provocation. You murdered millions of your own citizens. And what about the American citizens of the Japanese race who were put into protective custody in your own concentration camps? That was wrong. And why was this not done to American citizens of Italian and German descent? I said it was wrong 
And what about the Negro officers in your own army? Are they allowed to command troops in combat? Can they sit on the same buses as the whites? The segregation laws in your country and the anti-Semitic laws in mine, are they not just a difference of degree? Let me tell you, from the beginning of the century, through the first war, until the rise of Hitler, the Freemasonry of the Jewish merchants consistently undermined the German economy and the nationhood of the fatherland. That is why we made anti-Semitic laws and why you, my friend, can never understand anti-Semitism. Why? Because you are a Jew. Is Defense Council ready to proceed? Ready, Your Honor. Herr Zauker, from March 1942, you were in charge of procuring labor for the war effort. Is that right? Yeah. You are aware that it was a crime under the Hague Conventions to forcibly deport citizens of other countries to Germany as workers. Yeah. How many foreign workers came into Germany during your tenure? Approximately five million. And how many of them came voluntarily? <clears throat> Perhaps 200,000. Did you issue these directives calling for their decent treatment? I did, yeah. I asked that these be marked as exhibits and accepted into evidence. So ordered. That's Alcor. Who ordered you to procure these workers? Speer. Albert Speer, Minister of Armaments. He gave orders to you. Yeah. And you had to obey them. Yeah. Every worker you brought in, it was under Speer's orders. It was. No further questions. I know this is unorthodox, Mr. Dutt, to request an audience with you. The man assigned to cross-examine me. Well, there's nothing very orthodox about this whole trial, Dr. Speer. My lawyer has been trying to talk me out of confessing to war crimes that might incur the death penalty. But I do not wish to hide the truth, just to save my life, only to hate myself for the rest of that life. Well, I wish the other defendants shared that view. As some of them do. But many are still under Goering's influence. He's your chief rival for the souls of the other defendants, if I may put it so dramatically. Goering was cross-examined by the Chief Prosecutor, Justice Jackson. Well, I am to be questioned by you, a subordinate. This difference has been noticed by the other defendants. In their eyes, it puts me in an inferior status to Goering. That's a peculiar measure of status, Dr. Speer. Well, not to a German war criminal. I hope you don't have a problem with it. No, no, no. I got no ego writing on this. I'll present your request to my superior, Mr. Jackson. Dr. Speer, did you disapprove of Saukel's recruitment of labor? On the contrary, I was grateful to Saukel for every worker he provided. Whenever we failed to meet armament quotas because of shortage of workers, I would blame Saukel. Do you wish to limit your responsibility to your own particular sphere of work? No. This war has brought an inconceivable catastrophe. As an important member of the leadership of the Reich, I share in the total responsibility for the disaster of the German people. But Dr. Speer, near the end of the war, did you not refuse to carry out Hitler's order to raise Germany to the ground? I have no intention of using my actions during that phase of the war to help me in my personal defense. But I would like those who sit in judgment of me to understand that period. In March of 1945, Hitler intended deliberately to destroy the means of life for his own people if the war were lost. He said, let the Allies conquer nothing but ashes. But you resisted his wishes, sending him instead this memorandum. Could you read it to the court, please? Nobody has the right to destroy industrial plants, coal mines, electrical plants, and other facilities. We have no right to carry out destruction which might affect the life of the people. Signed, Speer. 
We have heard here that people were shot for disagreeing with Hitler. Is this true? That it happened. And yet, not only did you disagree with him, but early in 1945, you actually made a plan to assassinate Hitler. <laughs> Is that not so? Yes, it is so. It is so. Because of what I viewed as his insane destructiveness. What did you do? What was your plan? I knew of an air intake shaft in the Reich Chancellery Garden that ventilated the Führerbunker below. I went to the head of my munitions department and said, there's only one way to end this war, and asked him to get me a poison gas to drop into the ventilating system. But the next time I went there, they had built a 12-foot chimney protecting the ventilator and as escorts were patrolling there, so it came to nothing. <laughs> Mr. Chief Prosecutor? Dr. Speer, you acknowledge responsibility for Germany's large policies, but not for the details occurred in their execution. Is that a fair statement of your position? Yes, sir. Very fair. May I ask the witness a question in order to clarify this answer, please? You may. Do you want to acknowledge guilt under criminal law? Or do you wish to record an historical responsibility before your own people and before history? The question is a very difficult one to answer. Mm. It is actually one which the tribunal will decide in its verdict. Assassinate the Fuhrer? I tell you this, you coward. If you get out of this alive, we'll put together our own court and execute you for treason! As a German officer, I consider it my duty to answer for all I have done. It will not always be possible to separate guilt from the threads of destiny. But the men in the front lines cannot be charged with guilt while the highest leaders reject responsibility. That is wrong. It was my guilt. And unworthy. Which I carry before God and the entire German nation. That I educated the youth of Germany for a man who I considered to be an impeccable leader and head of state. But I educated the youth of Germany for a man a thousand years will pass. who committed murder a million four. That the guilt of Germany will not yet be erased. Afternoon, Captain. Yeah. The prisoners aren't allowed visitors. Yeah. I am the wife of Reichsmarschall Gering. This is his daughter. No exceptions, ma'am. Frau Goering. Frau Goering. Hi, my name is Captain Gilbert. Hello. Nice to meet you. Would you have a moment to spend with me? To talk? Yes. Very good. This is Ada. Hello, Ada. I'm Captain Gilbert. Do you like chocolate? It must have been very difficult for you these last few months. Especially with your little girl. It could have been worse, I suppose. 
Hitler could have survived. You obviously come to terms with the truth. I only wish your husband could do the same, but he persists in remaining loyal to Hitler's memory. Yes. I cannot understand it either. Such loyalty. The man who wanted us dead. I'm sorry? Hitler ordered all of us to be shot. Hermann, myself, our precious child. That is why we surrendered to the Americans. Why else would we have done such a thing? I went through my notes last night. I've spent all these months trying to find a way inside their minds. Hoping to understand how those people could commit such atrocities against my people. I believe there are a couple of factors that explain a lot of it. First, Germany is a country where people do what they're told. You obey your parents, teachers, clergymen, superior officers. You're raised from childhood not to question authority. So when Hitler comes to power, he has an entire nation that believes it's perfectly natural to do whatever he says. Second, propaganda. For years, Germans have been bombarded with ideas like Jews are not real human beings, or they're a corruption of the race. So when the government says it's permissible to deny Jews their rights and then says it's imperative to kill these inferior people, they comply even if they've been your friends or neighbors. Anything else? I told you once that I was searching for the nature of evil. I think I've come close to defining it. A lack of empathy. It's the one characteristic that connects all the defendants. A genuine incapacity to feel with their fellow man. Evil, I think, is the absence of empathy. I call on the chief prosecutor for his closing argument. Mr. President and members of the tribunal, it is impossible in summation to do more than outline with bold strokes the vitals of this trial's mad and melancholy record, for no time has ever witnessed slaughter on such a grand scale, such cruelties and inhumanities, such wholesale deportations of peoples into slavery, such annihilations of minorities events which will live as the historical text of the 20th century's shame and depravity. Terror was the order of the day. Civilians were arrested without charges, committed without counsel, executed without hearing. Villages were destroyed. The male inhabitants shot were sent to forced labor, and the children scattered abroad. The Nazi movement will be of evil memory in history because of its persecution of the Jews, the most far-flung and terrible racial persecution of all time. So thorough and uncompromising was this program that the Jews of Europe as a race no longer exist, thus fulfilling the diabolic prophecy of Adolf Hitler at the beginning of the war. Generations to come will remember this decade. If we cannot eliminate the cause and prevent the repetition of these barbaric events, this century may yet succeed in bringing the doom of civilization. The time has come for final judgment, and if the case that I present seems hard and uncompromising, then it is only because the evidence makes it so. A glance at the dock will show that despite quarrels among themselves, 
Each defendant played a part that fitted in with every other, and all advanced a common plan. It was these men among millions of others, and it was these men leading millions of others who built up Adolf Hitler. They intoxicated him. He, of the psychopathic personality with power and adulation. They fed his hates and aroused his fears. They put a loaded gun in his eager hands. It was left to Hitler to pull the trigger, and when he did, they all, at that time, applauded. Hitler's guilt stands admitted by some defendants reluctantly, by some vindictively. But Hitler's guilt is the guilt of the whole doc and of every man in it. These defendants now ask this tribunal to say they are not guilty of planning, executing, or conspiring to commit this long list of crimes and wrongs. They stand before the record of this tribunal as blood-stained Gloucester stood by the body of his slain king. He begged the widow, as they beg of you, say, I slew them not. And the queen replied, then say they are not slain. But dead they are. If you were to say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say that there has been no war. There are no slain. There has been no crime. Captain? Jews escalate fight for homeland. It's ironic. Well, after everything that's happened over the past 10 years, I don't blame the Jews for wanting a homeland. One of many ripples we'll see from this war and from this trial. Shall we? Yeah. The defendants may now make their final statements. Defendant Hermann Goering. This has been a poor excuse for a trial. But firstly, I must reiterate my lack of knowledge for these terrible mass murders, which I cannot begin to understand. And furthermore, I condemn wholeheartedly. As to the trial, the statement of the defendants were accepted as true only when they supported the prosecution. They were treated as perjury when they refuted the indictment. This is not a basis of proof. Why am I in the dock being treated as a common criminal? I said to my judges, have no illusions. Since the three greatest powers on earth, together with other nations, fought against us, we finally were conquered by tremendous enemy superiority, justice absolutely nothing to do with this trial. Defendant Albert Speer. How could so advanced, so cultured, so sophisticated a nation as Germany have fallen under Hitler's demonic sway. The explanation is modern communications. No longer does a leader have to delegate authority of father subordinates exercising independent judgment. Given modern communications, a Hitler can rule directly and personally. 
Thus, the more technical the world becomes, the more individual freedom and the self-rule of mankind becomes essential. This war has ended on the note of radio-controlled rockets, aircraft approaching the speed of sound, submarines and torpedoes which can find their own targets, atom bombs, and the horrible prospect of chemical warfare. In five to ten years, this kind of warfare will offer the possibility of firing rockets from continent to continent with uncanny precision. Through the smashing of the atom, it will be possible to destroy a million people in New York City in a matter of seconds with a rocket serviced by perhaps 10 men. A new large-scale war will end with the destruction of human culture and civilization. That is why this trial must contribute to the prevention of such wars in the future. A nation believing in its future will never perish. May God protect Germany and the culture of the West. We are agreed. Three of four votes will be required for the finding of guilt. Agreed. Agreed. Now, if the judgment is death, might we not consider the firing squad for the military defendants? I disagree most strongly. The bullet is for the honorable adversary, not the butchers. I say hanging. I agree. Agreed. We will take the defendants in the order they were indicted. Gary. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> bravo, bravo. Go <laughs> mm. 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 have some of the lovely food. Let's talk that you will all be hanged. I won't be hanged. That I assure you. That I plan to. Perhaps the court will send you to an island like Elba. And we could join you there. Go on, eat. Eat. <laughs> Do you think? We would be allowed to take some months of food home with us? I don't see why not. The charter clearly states that following orders may be considered in mitigation of punishment. Maybe, not must be. You have become such. Beautiful young ladies. So when are they going to shoot you, Papa? Hans Frank is the most tragic figure in my view. His penitence is obviously real. It would be a meaningful gesture for us. Spare his life. No. He should hang.
Each defendant will stand, as his name is called, to hear the judgments on the four counts applicable to him, and the sentence, if found guilty on any of the counts. The counts, numbered one through four, are conspiracy to commit aggression, the commission of aggression, crimes in the conduct of warfare, and crimes against humanity. Defendant Hermann Goering. The tribunal finds you guilty on all four counts and sentences you to death by hanging. <laughs> Rudolf Hess. On the charges of crimes against humanity, the tribunal finds you not guilty. But we find you guilty on counts one and two, and thereby sentence you to imprisonment for life. Admiral Wilhelm Keitel, guilty on all four counts. The tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Hans Frank, the tribunal finds you guilty on counts three and four and sentences you to death by hanging. Julius Streicher, guilty on count four, crimes against humanity, death by hanging. Defendant Schacht, the tribunal has come to the conclusion that the evidence against Halmar Schacht has not been established beyond a reasonable doubt, and therefore finds that Schacht is not guilty on this indictment. Quiet, please. The defendant Karl Dönitz, guilty on counts two and three. The tribunal sentences you to 10 years imprisonment. Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop, guilty on all four counts. The tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, guilty on counts three and four. The tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Balder von Schirach, guilty on count four. 20 years in prison. Alfred Yodel, on all four counts, guilty. Death by hanging. Hans Fritscher, not guilty. Franz von Papen, not guilty. Walter Funk, guilty on counts two, three, and four. The tribunal sentenced you to imprisonment for life. Defendant Fritz Sauker, guilty on counts three and four, death by hanging. Defendant Albert Speer, the tribunal finds you not guilty on counts one and two, but you have been found guilty on counts three and four. Albert Speer, the court sentences you to 20 years imprisonment. The work of this tribunal is now complete.
Don't, my dear Tex. Why this long face? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have I not told you there's a special place in Valhalla waiting for me? I don't know. I just thought things might have turned out differently, that's all. Well, you know, they might have done. But for one very unfortunate thing. Those mass murders. I must tell you, I could not see their purpose. They were absolutely unnecessary. They made no sense from a nationalistic point of view. Our legacy has been forever attainted. But make no mistake. Everything Hitler did before the war was right. The German people knew it. And one day they will eventually remember it. And you must remember it too, my dear Tex. When you remember me, remember that, huh? Yeah. Now, the practical matters. Ah, there are a few things I want to give you. No, oh, sir. Sure, 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 sure. Please, please. Mm. <laughs> Where I'm going, I must travel light. <laughs> Inscribe, see, with my name. Take it. Take it. The few valuables I have, they are in my blue briefcase in the baggage room. Can you retrieve that for me, my dear Tex? Yes, sir. I have only one question to ask you. Is there absolutely no possibility that I may be allowed to face a firing squad and die a soldier's death? None. Just as well. I hear the Americans are very poor shots. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must write a letter. For the rest of my life, Herr Reichs Marshal, people will ask me what your final thoughts were. We'll have nothing to tell them. You can tell them this. I say, for now and all time, the foreigners who imposed the sentence upon me may murder me, but they have no right to judge me. That I deny them. Now, you must excuse me. I do have to write this letter. My one and only sweetheart. My life came to an end when I bade you farewell for the last time. Do not grieve, my dearest one. Since then, I have felt at peace with myself and consider my death a deliverance. All my thoughts are with you and our own dear sweet child. My last heartbeats of our great and eternal love.
may I? You got what you want? I got it, sir. Gentlemen, follow me. Son of a bitch. State your name. Yeah, I keep von Ribbentrop. You have anything to say? My last wish is that Germany realize its destiny. I wish peace to the world. <laughs> Join my sons. Deutschland über alles. Cells have been scrubbed clean. Nothing's to be left. Nothing. Nothing. 
Dankeschön. Thanks. You know, when we get home, we've got some decisions to make. Some personal decisions. Bob, let's just wait till we get home. Hello, you two. You know, it may sound strange, but I can't help feeling a touch sentimental about all this. I understand. I got a letter from a friend today saying that uh, because of what we've done here, none of it can ever happen again. What do you think? Well, we can hope, can't we? <laughs> 